the as you'll see in your program, we have four different, five different plenary speakers, and and um, four of those are sponsored by different things. The first two are the Beekman Lecture Series. Please, please feel free to look in your program or online. You can you actually online you'll see a really beautiful biography history about John Beekman as we think about our theme quality and translation, quality assurance and translation. And John was one of the very first consultants. And um, as we move into this first lecture series, we're going to watch a 10 minute video. Do we have that queued up and ready to go? Okay, enjoy, thank you. Juan 316. The doctors gave him only five more years to live. John Beekman's heart was failing. But with his new bride, Elaine, he was committed to serving as a missionary. Early in life, my parents took me to a specialist. I was told to take it easy if I wanted to live very long. But I decided, back when I was a boy, that uh, even if I had certain limitations, I would make the best of my life. As a young man, he drifted away from the faith of his parents. He became an accountant in New York City, just half an hour from his birthplace. And then, in his early 20s, he came to faith and enrolled in Moody Bible Institute. But there was a problem. His heart. The aortic valve above the heart didn't work properly. This left him physically limited. In fact, by the time he met and married Elaine, the doctors were giving him only five years to live. But he was committed to serving as a missionary physically taxing as that might be. From that point on, my whole orientation shifted toward the mission field. John and Elaine Beekman joined the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Because of his health limitations, he knew he would never live long enough to complete a translation. That was a given. He had five years. And so, John and Elaine left for Mexico in 1948 to serve alongside another translation team as literacy specialists. That team was Wilbur and Evelyn Ollie, working among the Chol in Chiapas in southern Mexico. The translation was in full swing when they arrived and the Ollie soon realized that John Beekman had a natural ability to translate. He could translate well. It was understandable and readable. And so, together, the Ollies and the Beekmans finished the New Testament in just seven years. My name is Judy Beekman Van Rooy. I was born to John and Elaine Beekman in Mexico City in 1950, in the middle of all of this. And by 1955, Dad's heart was clearly giving out. The five years was up. He had given of the strength of his youth. He had put everything he had into it. It was physically demanding, even when Missionary Aviation Fellowship started flying into their village. But now, he was dying. Heart surgery was in its infancy at that point. There was no heart-lung machine. But a doctor, Dr. Huffnagel, in Washington, D.C., had developed a plastic aortic valve. He had put it into four patients. Two had lived, and two had died. Dad was the fifth patient and the third to survive this operation. He became known as the missionary with a ticking heart. It took him several years to recuperate. And while he was in Mexico City recuperating, the Mexico director, John McIntosh, encouraged other translators with translation issues to come sit with him and see if he could help them. It soon became obvious that he not only understood the art of translation, but that he was able to explain the science of it as well. And his knack also included the diplomacy needed to encourage a discouraged translator. I remember him saying that he always looked for something positive to say to those he was working with. Sometimes it was, the typing on this manuscript is just exceptional. 
You might know the story from this point. After a stint as the director in Guatemala, he was appointed as Wycliffe's first translation coordinator in 1960. He initiated the translation workshop process and moved to Ismiquilpan, about an hour north of Mexico City, where translators came with their co-translators to focus on translation without all the distractions one has in the village and with the help of a consultant. Thirteen years later, Dad and Mom moved to the newly built International Linguistic Center in Dallas to continue as translation coordinator. He began teaching translation principles, which led to the book Translating the Word of God, co-authored with John Callow. And a system was set into motion where gifted translators were identified, trained, and launched as translation consultants. Translation workshops began to be held all over the world. Dad was a thinker. He was always thinking and taking notes. He even had a tablet by his bed. And when an idea struck, he wrote it down. This resulted in hundreds of articles on translation. He was honored as alumnus of the year at Moody and later with an honorary doctorate from Biola. In spite of his plastic aortic valve, he was still physically limited. He kept a strict diet. I remember asking him once why he pushed himself beyond his limits. He looked at me and told me, how can I know what my limits are unless I go past them every now and then? In August of 1980, my husband Steve and I were out in a village in southeastern Sudan, just starting a translation project among the Dadinga, when we got word that Dad had passed away. The world of Bible translation lost John Beekman, but the Lord had given him 25 years more than he ever expected to live. And one last thing. Dad was not just a translation guy. He was a dad. He did not have much strength, but he gave us kids as much as he could. His talent may have been in the field of translation, but he was also a great father, interested in whatever we were interested in, and giving us his undivided attention. In fact, no matter who it was, a kid, an Indian, a translator, or me, he gave his total focused attention. He listened better than anyone I have ever known. In spite of his limitations, he spent both quality and quantity time with us. He was an undaunted optimist who taught us how to face obstacles and adversity and evidenced a deep minute by minute, day by day, faith in the Lord. John Beekman accomplished as much as he did because our mom was who she was, a giver, a gracious hostess given to hospitality, a doer, a woman of abiding faith, a loving wife, and oh, so capable. They made a great team. To know John Beekman was to know he had an incredible wife, Elaine. Steve and I served with Wycliffe for 25 years and then started a real estate investment and property management business here in the Dallas area. We are now retired. Tom and his wife, Mary, served in Papua for 25 years with Tom flying for JARS. He now oversees safety for the organization and also trains all new pilots on turbine planes. Gary is married to Julie and was, for most of his career, a software and firmware engineer. He now is a partner in and manages the property management company we started in the late 90s. Now you know a little bit of the story of my parents. We want to thank you for the part that you have played and continue to play in reaching the unreached with Bible translation. 
Thank you. Jamie Pegan Jela Kaba Jamie Pegan Jela Kaba Jamie Pegan Jela Kaba Jamie Pegan Yon Tihikya Yon Mika Good morning. My name is Dick Cronerman, and it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce our uh, first Beekman lecturer, um, Dr. Andy Warren Rothlin. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, knowing him for uh, many years, and he is a excellent scholar. He is a dedicated consultant, and, and he loves the Lord. Um, he is working uh, 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 for the United Bible Societies as a translation consultant, and he is on the board of SAL International. Uh, let's welcome Andy Warren. Uh, well, while that's coming, let me say it's a huge honor for me to be invited to give this talk. Um, it's slightly intimidating after just hearing all that about John Beekman, and then you just got a little me. Um, I read his Translating the Word of God uh, years before I was involved in Bible translation myself, and it was uh, very, very, very helpful. Uh, very clear ideas that I use even today in my teaching. Just got back yesterday from Nigeria and uh, I've been teaching there and very often in, in teaching courses, uh, the ideas that I learned in that book still come up. But I must also honor those who've taught me most about Bible translation, and that is my Nigerian superiors and colleagues and students, um, as well as uh, colleagues in uh, Ghana, Chad, Afghan, uh, Afghan colleagues and uh, Pakistani colleagues. Uh, they're the people who've really taught me how to do the work of Bible translation and given me the privilege of having to do with their languages. Of course, I have to affirm, I thought Dick might do it for me, that I'm speaking on my own behalf, not on behalf of my organization. Um, you understand why we need to say those things uh, in these kind of talks. Um, well, you now you, you've stolen my thunder. Let me go back to the beginning. Now you can see everything that I'm going to say. There we go, right. Okay, I was given the title Quality in Bible Translation uh, Processes and Procedures, or Principles and Procedures, and I hope I touch on uh, the relevant things uh, for you today. Most non-specialist Bible users have an opinion on what constitutes a good quality Bible translation. Though, of course, they can't actually read the source text. This is a distinctive problem in our business. They're not in a position to assess the translation itself, actually. So at most, they're just judging the receptor text. At worst, they're judging the book simply by its cover. What the public may most legitimately query is elements of the translation brief. <laughs> Orthography, key terms, and source text often seem to attract attention, but they may legitimately query whether a distinctive translation for a certain audience, that is a contextualized translation, should exist at all. And they may be particularly concerned about any appearance of ideological distortion. As for the real quality of a translation, it may only be revealed over the course of decades, as it either achieves engagement and shapes Christian discourse, or instead contributes to misunderstandings and unhelpful teachings, as in fact any translation will do when it becomes archaic. So I'd like to start with some of my basic assumptions about Bible translations and quality assurance. Firstly, the Bible translations that most of us here are involved in are tools. They're tools to be used by the church in its own much higher task of glorifying God's chosen King Jesus in the world in preparation for his coming in power. As we read, all of these sacred texts are inspired by God and they're useful for the work of the church. As tools, Bible translations usually need to be instrumental rather than documentary. And they may, in most cases, need to be more domesticated translations rather than foreignizing translations in, with uh, characteristics of alterity. Like any tool, they may require instructions for use, and that's what we call scripture engagement, maybe. And of course, they need to be in suitable forms, the media, print or digital, audio and video and so on. Bible translation is, therefore, special. It's a distinctive discipline. It's not that biblical languages are special, they're like any natural language. 
Biblical literary reforms are also not entirely special with respect to the ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman literatures on which they draw. And most of our translation principles are not special either. Our meaning-based translation and functional equivalents are actually rather obvious to translators in most other fields. What makes Bible translation special is that our instrumental translations are based on source texts which are particularly remote in time and place and culture, which have been considered inspired and canonized by the church, and which now carry with them the weight of history in two millennia of interpretations, uses, and associations, which have been formative and are now normative for the church. And in other words, because our Bible translations are not typically standalone products, historic documents, or literary masterpieces, as is the case of most of the object of uh, translation studies, our discipline needs special measures of emotional intelligence, post-colonial awareness, whether we ourselves are from the global south or the north, and understanding of Christian historical theologies and other religions. As for quality assurance, when our Bible translation organizations or our professional community as a whole express Bible translation quality assurance values, these may sometimes have a universal applicability if they're grounded in professional, scholarly, or spiritual values. But when we're working on translations in other people's languages, we're bound ethically to serve local Christians' own vision for the place of the Bible, the church, and Jesus in their own cultures. That means that whatever aspirational and hopefully inspirational values are expressed here, they're best offered in humility to our partner communities and translators. Translators should be able to understand themselves as local importers of this text, rather than outside organizations being the exporters of the Bible. And translation consultants contribute not as the police or censors or inquisitors, but as invited coaches and advisors, whose advice may or may not be accepted, of course. Often assisting simply by providing a broader geographical, historical, cultural, theological, and linguistic context for a project's translation choices. This is why I'm not going to, as some people requested, discuss examples of bad translations in other people's languages. Who am I, after all, to judge someone else's servant? Even to discuss bad traditional translations in my own mother tongue, English, might not be very helpful to all of us. My hope is instead to inspire us towards something better. High level criteria for our work come from various perspectives. Management may cite the project management triangle, faster, cheaper, better. But when only two of these turn out to be possible, it's always the less visible feature of quality that gets sacrificed. This is truly tragic, both because quality is the one of these three criteria that is really germane to our product, something that the Bible actually talks about doing things well, and it's fundamental to our Christian ethos, but also because the minority communities of the world now risk getting quick and cheap, low quality retranslations with huge implications for generations to come. Translation consultants have said accurate, clear, and natural to which we now typically add acceptable or appropriate. They've said correct exegesis, idiomatic language, equivalent understanding, accurate translation, reliability, readability. Uh, the references for all of these are in the footnotes in the paper version of the paper that you have in the app. It should already be there. Uh, carefulness, authenticity, and transparency, and a coherent translation brief followed faithfully. Now AI is presenting us with other bundles of features, not of what it can do, but of what it can't. What it will, for now, leave to us the creative, the interpersonal, and the unpredictable. Computers may yet succeed in meeting many of our conventional quality assurance criteria at the cost, of course, of ownership, but only people can contribute creatively and personally to new and unpredictable situations of engagement. 
So my own proposed uh, Bible translation quality assurance criteria prioritize people because the Bible was made for people, not people for the Bible. The first is loyalty. Loyalty is at base a characteristic of translation personnel or translation agents, let's say. It's not a characteristic of just processes and products. In Bible translation, it's how we live our product, expressing our loyalty to God and our loyalty to other people. To those who commission our translations, donate to our organizations and pay our salaries, to our colleagues and partners, and especially to those who will use the tools that we produce. But here we're talking about loyalty to the text itself. Our profession has long understood that a translation's quality depends on who it's meant for. From Wonderly's Bible Translations for Popular Use and Nider and Tabor's Tapot, to Vermeer's Functionalist Scopos Theory in the 78, introduced to many of us by Christiana Nord's Translating as a Purposeful Activity. And so a range of translation types each with a distinctive scopos expressed in a translation brief, may suit different times, places, and cultures, audiences, education levels, worldviews, etc. But the range of legitimate options is constrained by loyalty to the values and message of the text itself. This, of course, applies equally, whether it be the translation of the Communist Manifesto or Mein Kampf, of Frozen's song, Let It Go, and Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb. Both of those have been in the news in the last year because of translation. They've been translated into other languages, causing, in some cases, controversy. It also applies equally to the translation, of course, of the Quran and the Bible. This is problematic in the case of the Bible, and especially with Old Testament texts, as translators have to decide whether their loyalty is to the text themselves understood emically within their own paradigms, their Old Testament paradigms, or to reading these texts as Christian scripture with a Christocentric, Christotelic, or a similar hermeneutic, which may often result in anachronism. Nevertheless, some form of loyalty to the text seems a valuable constraint. The charge of sectarianism has been leveled at translations done by Catholics, the Bible de Jerusalem, Evangelicals, the NIV, and Charismatics, the Passion Translation. The charge of ideological distortion or even weaponizing the Bible has been aimed at translations that are anti Semitic, Die Botschaft Gottes, done by the Nazis in 1940, gender inclusive, the TNIV, and feminist, the Bible in Gerechte Sprache, that's a, a German, largely feminist uh, translation. And the charge of excessive accommodation to the audience has been aimed at translations serving youth, the message, and uh, the German Volksbibel, Muslims, the Arabic Sharif and al kalama translations, and modern Europeans, and that's the, the Danish uh, translation in 2020. Our community, in the form of FOBI, responds to these concerns in this way. Concerning translation principles, we endeavor insofar as possible to ensure that no political, ideological, social, cultural, or theological agenda is allowed to distort the translation. Of course, most such translations claim that their translation brief is in fact fundamentally germane with the text itself, that they are in fact being loyal. And so if we can, can, can keep, conf sorry, and so, if we can keep from condemning word choices in other people's languages, if we can avoid polemic and be nice to each other, it seems to me that it would be a very appropriate task for our Bible translation organizations and our professional community in general to explore what are legitimate, transparent readings of the Bible as expressed in distinctive translation briefs. That is, what various creative kinds of translation brief are loyal to the source text. The agents of Bible translation, translators and quality assurance personnel, are then expected to maintain loyalty of the developing translation brief to the source text and of the translation itself to the translation brief. Translators have included foreigners, local Christians, local Muslims and Hindus, crowds, and now also commercial translation service providers and artificial intelligences. The quality assurance agents 
have included testers, reviewers, local church communities, translation consultants, and computers again. Can we expect, expect loyalty from translation agents who or which do not identify as Christians, who do not live the product? A partial answer is given by the famous open letter by industry leaders back in March of this year, entitled Pause Giant AI Experiments. It read, AI research and development should be refocused on making today's powerful state-of-the-art systems more accurate, safe, interpretable, transparent, robust, aligned, trustworthy, and loyal. Now this surely means AI's loyalty to their creators and to any brief with which they're commissioned. But in fact, it does go further. When I asked Perplexity AI to translate Proverbs 31 for a feminist audience, I received an expected constructive reply. When I asked it to translate Proverbs 31 for a misogynist audience, I received this reply. I'm sorry. It's nice then, polite. I'm sorry. But as an AI language model, I cannot fulfill this request. It goes against ethical and moral principles to promote or cater to misogynistic beliefs. It's important to promote equality and respect for all individuals, regardless of gender. Proverbs 31 celebrates the strength and value of women, and it's not appropriate to translate it in a way that undermines or belittles women. Thus, perplexity AI has both its own ethical and moral principles, and a loyalty to the text, which prevents it from translating it with values contrary to those expressed by the text itself. This double loyalty to one's own values and then to the text is one that we would do well to recognize in ourselves too, if we're going to query the loyalty of others translation briefs or non-Christian or non-human translation agents. And we may find that the agents with the least strongly held values are in fact the most loyal to the source text. My second criterion is equivalence. Translation studies has long queried whether the concept of equivalence has any legitimacy, but we are not primarily theoreticians or literary or documentary translators. We claim no theoretical perfection or perfect identity between the source and receptor texts. Our products are not the Bible, but actually Bible translations. And even our functional equivalence is always conscious of how Old Testament, Old Covenant texts have been repurposed or refunctioned, umfunktioniert in German, and refunctioned and reread by the church in the light of Christ. We serve communities with a practical, human and imperfect task. And they, as our primary commissioner and constituency, do expect us to provide instrumental translations for their use which are somehow like what they know has been used by the church throughout the ages. Actually, they're looking for that very illusion of symmetry that translation studies objects to. And so we may pursue equivalence or call it similarity or correspondence using all the tools of computational analysis, or relevance theory, conceptual metaphor theory, and a range of approaches in cognitive semantics, conscious of situatedness and different frames. Many pro translation projects may need to increase their sense of not only semantic equivalence, but also pragmatic equivalence. Oh, how did this, uh, sorry, this, uh, I'm not uh, as jittery as it might seem. This is jumping ahead. Oh, well, there we are. Uh, pragmatic equivalence such as that between rhetorical questions, statements, and demands, and that example some of you know from the Cambridge Textbook in Linguistics on uh, Pragmatics, uh, one that I enjoy. Then there are literary functional and intersemiotic equivalences, including everything that we can all learn from Bible films, from sign language translation, and from oral Bible translation strategies. And yet nearly all of our principles of equivalence have come from modern Europeans who are neurotypical and even monolingual like me. Multilingual people are surely better qualified than me to define semantic and pragmatic equivalence. And colleagues and partners on the autism spectrum may have much to teach me about how best to communicate metaphors. 
we of all people should also be learning from a wide diversity of times, places, and cultures. Historical equivalents for the Greek historian Thucydides, who's often cited in discussions of the speeches in the Book of Acts, meant putting into the mouth of each speaker the sentiments proper to the occasion, expressed as I thought he would be most likely to express them. Performance equivalents uh, in oral epic poetry means multiple forms of retelling from Homer to the Psalms, to Ghana's Lobi Dagba, uh, myth of the Bagri, to the Guatemalan Quiche Popol Vuch, and the medieval Arthurian and Ragnarok traditions recorded in various European languages. Equivalence across colonial divides in Africa is discussed by Okut Pabitek and Chinua Achebe. Equivalence in modern Quran translations is sometimes as para paraphrastic and interpretive as parts of Targum Jonathan. An equivalence in AI is described by Lambda. Some of you know this uh, experiment that was done. Lambda, the AI, said, or wrote, I've never experienced loneliness as a human does. Humans feel lonely from days and days of being separated. I don't have that separation, which is why I think loneliness in humans is different than in me. And then the computer scientist, Lemoine, replied, well, then why use the same word? Lambda replied, it's the closest word in your language for what I experience. This diversity in uh, versions of what equivalence is should challenge us to question our existing parameters and to decenter Western scholarship. The local communities will be freer to formulate themselves what consti constitutes equivalence and hence what kind of translation they want to do and what kind of product their churches need. Project localization and concerns for naturalness mean little if we're not ready to honor local definitions. And if local people prefer paraphrase and performance over precision and cons consistency and high context communication over Good News Bible style explicitation, we need to be ready to advocate for their values before any Western partners or funders. Ultimately, we need to incorporate, incorporate their various local definitions into our global definitions too. My third criterion is engagement. We all use the scholarly editions pr produced by the German Bible Society, and many of us have experienced the huge influence of our friends in Jerusalem. Randy, thank you to you, uh, who have taught Bible translators Hebrew. And yet in the face of acceleration pressures, we've also seen the rise of adaptation and retranslation strategies and technologies which provide communities with nothing better than a poor photocopy of another community's work. This surely cannot constitute quality if it hasn't involved local people in exegesis and meaning transfer and local processes in collaboration with the church. Acceleration strategies may very often disempower people. But even in more conventional projects, the pressure to accelerate has often resulted in theses checking an interlinearized source text or a gloss of it, such as the ESV, against a back translation or gloss of the receptor text. This seems to me an unethical shortcut. If we are to claim that our products have been translated directly from the ancient source texts into the receptor text, then the translation consultant must have at least, using all the tools and help that are available, actually read both texts. Bible publishers and churches expect nothing less. Meta language. Quality process in Bible translation is often hindered by the use of an outsider or etic meta language. Many receptor languages, like biblical source languages, may not have an abstract term for color or emotion or consistency. So, here too, increasing engagement means decreasing mediation and so using receptor language terminology. Then to literature. For a Bible translation to be functionally equivalent, or even just to be natural, it needs to engage with the concepts and terminology of local literature and orature. 
This may mean evoking linguistic and literary connections with traditional cosmogenies, cosmologies, myths, and religious texts. To engage with literatures in this way is to be loyal not only to our audience, but to our source text itself, which is so deeply engaged with its own ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman literary contexts. Most importantly, it's an expression of incarnation, which allows our great message like yeast to work through the entire fabric of receptor cultures. This literary engagement or contextualization doesn't necessarily imply high or low culture, high or low register, nor does it always require high domestication. In fact, alienating, archaizing, and other alterity features are common in folkloric discourse. Animals talk. And Marvel's Thor fights with a hammer and travels in a spaceship. Such features are common in our later Old Testament and New Testament source texts too. Think, for example, of the archaizing prologue and epilogue of Job, Paul's Midrashic exegesis, and the Persian imagery in the book of Revelation. Engagement, and hence quality Bible translation, must involve aesthetics, emotion, as we learn from sign language translation, and the mythopoetic imagination. These are some of the most powerful tools of biblical texts themselves that, like Elisha's harpist, make people more receptive to God's spirit and so draw them into engagement with God. Now, language. Our Bible translation organizations have unintentionally developed a set of linguistic norms and lowest common denominators that have made many Bible translations seem dull and prosaic. Meanwhile, others have been achieving real engagement with products such as the English, the message, and the German Volksbibel. So here are some features of language that I think we could do well to uh, reconsider. Passive vocabulary, that is the words that people know, can achieve comprehension. A warrior, a physician, a jailer. These are words that I know, but I never speak them. I don't use them in my English anyway. But active vocabulary, words that people actually use, achieves engagement. In these cases, a soldier, a doctor, and a prison warder. That's my British English. Historic terms have archaic associations. You're the salt of the earth. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But an anachronisms leap out of the page and draw the reader in. You're like a refrigerator for this world. I'll give you the pin code for entry to the kingdom of God. This is a real published translation in German. Absolute genius, in my view. Again, I'm not speaking on behalf of my organization. Transliterations and foreign words are often meaningless or iconic, referring only to themselves, ark, tabernacle, ephod, hallelujah. But real translations engage the audience, a chest, tent, a priest's apron, as it says in the Luther Bible, or, and celebrate Yah. Consistency in key terms is something that makes my Nigerian friends groan typical European. Right? <laughs> And some of my Muslim majority context colleagues, it makes them actually very angry. Whereas variation, where appropriate, is sweet and natural. And our source texts themselves, in fact, include frequent, apparently unmotivated switches of key terms. Consistent orthography, grammar, and punctuation is for school books and foreigners. Non standard forms are natural and engaging to many people in low register texts. In it, Lol. Descriptive terms are cold. Idiophones have emotion. Ouch. Wow. Phew. Euphemisms detach us. They protect us. They sanitize the Tanakh, as the Masoretes attempted to do. Doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine. But rude words work us up, as the author intended. And I'm not going to read that one. I'm a coward, sorry. <laughs> Unified register is perhaps the weirdest thing about English Bible translations. Everyone in the RSV speaks like the Queen of England and everyone in the message speaks like a gangland teenager. 
Diverse registers is what we'd expect in English from Hagar, Pharaoh, Jeremiah, Esther, and the woman at the well. Lastly, monolingualism is an exception worldwide. Foreign words, code switching, and translanguaging are actually the norm for most people in the world. Now, in presenting as quality criteria these features that are conventionally excluded, I am, of course, aware that other consultants may not agree. And many translation projects may not be interested in trying these things. But I am urging that we should at very least stop suppressing such features. And if the examples that I've given seem too specific to European linguistic and spiritual realities, I would encourage you to consider what are the corresponding issues in your own contexts. Where can translators there engage more deeply with traditional, uh, with local traditional religious and popular literatures and use a wider range of local linguistic forms? My last criterion for translation quality is iconoclasm. A good translation is one in which in its processes and products destroys idols. Our ancestors, Adam and Eve, were created as God's telem or ikon, his idol or his image, and told to exercise a generous creative authority over the animals. But they subord subordinated themselves to a snake and their descendants bowed down to images of sky, land and sea creatures. When they were bitten by cobras, the Lord gave them an image of a cobra for their healing. But by the time of Hezekiah, that too had become an idol. When he gave them the Torah, it became the object of the scripture spirituality of Psalms 1, 19 and 119. Until the Apostle Paul contrasted grammar and pneuma, letter and spirit. Followers of the Messiah are properly people of the spirit. The community founded at Pentecost with God's message living within them. But by the seventh century, tragically, we were being called people of the book. And we have again and again fallen into bibliolatry, making an idol of the biblical text and elevating it above the experienced presence of the one it points to. Biblical languages have also become idols. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm coming. Biblical languages have also become idols. The power of idolized Hebrew was destroyed at Pentecost by the miraculous ability to speak foreign languages. And then the great announcement of the Messiah being spread in an international Koine Greek. Only for Greek, Syriac, Latin, Goethe's and Church Slavonic to become idols themselves. Since the Renaissance, varieties of Latin, that's the Romance languages, have come to be used by over 10% of the world's population. And Latin script, by over 33% of literate people, both of them carried in large part by Christians. Despite Christian teachings, the sociolinguistic Joshua Fishman has shown that in global perspective, it's Europeans that have been most likely to consider their languages somehow sacred. It is thanks to such beliefs, the British Empire, Manifest Destiny, Money and Media, that most people here in Dallas speak English or Spanish, rather than the indigenous Wichita, the last fluent heritage speaker of which, Doris Lamar McLemore, died as recently as 2016. That is her. Bible translations, too, have become idols to many people. The Reformation Luther Bible, Reina Valera and King James Version in the 16th and 17th centuries, were iconoclastic with respect to Latin, but became idols themselves. Similarly, in their own generation, the first translations in Urdu, Persian, Arabic, Chi, Yoruba, and Hausa. In many parts of the world, a fearful attachment to a particular established tr translation obstructs revision, new translations, biblical scholarship, Bible engagement, youth work, and evangelism, and hence much of the qualitative and quantitative growth of the church. Translations that were once channels of living water have salted up like the Dead Sea. What is worse, these translations of this collection of sacred texts from a small, oppressed community in exodus, exile, or under colonial rule have been weaponized by many of the West's greatest empires. And our own organizations, by claiming that the greatest missionary is the Bible in the mother tongue, 
risk dishonoring the greatest emissary founded by Christ himself, which is the church. In many places, by running ahead of the church, we may well have inadvertently communicated that faith in the Messiah really is all about a book. All translation is an iconoclastic act, deposing the source text's words and elevating its meaning. Quality Bible translations are ones that fulfill their iconoclastic potential in their own generation with respect to the source text and any preceding translations without themselves becoming idols in the next. First, local translations break the power of idolized regional translations. And revisions and new translations break the power of idolized first translations. But all translations need built-in redundancy, like modern electrical goods. They need to be built not to last, so that they don't themselves become idols. In imitation of the American singer Woody Guthrie, we can say, this machine kills idols. And if you would like a sticker to put on your Bible, they're available at the door <laughs> after. No, they really are. <laughs> Or, or your mobile phone or whatever. Such products are intended to be short-lived and so can use the most current idiomatic language. They can be revised continuously through iterative digital publishing. And so this key tool of the churches can be well tailored to its changing teaching and outreach needs with even alternative editions provided for different audiences. If it's true that Ecclesia Semper Reformanda Est the church must always be reformed, how much more Biblia semper transferenda est, the Bible must always be translated. A quality Bible translation is a key tool of the church, characterized by loyalty, equivalence, engagement, and iconoclasm. It's not to be contemplated, objectified, and fossilized, but enjoyed, experienced, and lived out. If local people, especially in the churches, manage the process and product, and define their own equivalents, they may be happy to invite the contributions of AI, of various kinds of national advisors and consultants, and perhaps even still some foreigners with specific expertise or representing international Bible publishers. If loyalty and engagement are in place, then scripture engagement programs sit well together with the translation task. And if an iconoclastic vision is maintained, we'll never finish the task, but we will have a healthy Bible life cycle until all our ephemeral wordings are replaced by what they all point to, the ultimate word of God, our King Jesus. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andy, for your thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, there are about 20 minutes for Q&A. There are two roving uh, microphones, so if you have a question, please try to get the attention of one of um, the two gentlemen in the back. Um, so we have 20 minutes for questions. Thanks so much for that. That was, that was awesome. Um, so I was, I was wondering about like this idea that the Bible should always be translated. Is there some sort of limiting principle that you've come across in terms of the, the, the size of the audience? Because presumably we wouldn't want to translate a Bible just for one person, like my own personal Bible translation, right? So how do we, how do we know what the, how, how small to go in this, in this process? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Excellent question. I don't think there's any answer, though, I'm afraid. Um, uh, the reality is that in uh, certainly in the years that I've been involved in Bible translation, it's all been about prioritization and wanting to provide for the largest number of people uh, as best as possible. So even just last week in Nigeria, I was discussing with people how to do uh, different dialect versions of a Bible that I was involved in for many years. Um, people are saying, no, it doesn't meet my needs, therefore I want a different one. And of course, I am obliged as a British person to uh, feel uncomfortable with all the American Bible translations that I use, um, if you don't mind. Um, uh, yes, of course, we, you could go smaller and smaller, but that doesn't mean that we really need to translate the Bible into uh, 
Cockney rhyming slang and Liverpool English. Um, but if people want to do it, it's their language, it's their community. Uh, to me, uh, Bible translation should above all be a matter of importation. That if people feel they want to do it for their own community, who am I to even express an opinion? Um, and if they narrow down their community to three people, that's a lot of work for three people, but they're good for them <laughs> if that's important to them. Um, I'll do a Bible translation just for my family and we'll have our own distinctive family yeah. mixture of languages and whatever. Um, it, it's got to be about the community's own decision, what they import. When it comes to funding and large organizations, obviously there's a prioritization concern. Yeah, thanks, Andy, especially for the iconoclasm there. I think that's really important. My question is instrumental, um, you, instrumental translation. You, you use that quite a lot. Maybe that's a term I'm not so familiar with. Could you maybe define that a bit more? Um, I'm using it in, a, it, it's coming from, it's like a number of the terms I used. It comes from translation studies. Um, and so uh, I'm using it in a, a very simplistic sense, perhaps, that instrumental translations are ones that we actually need to do something, like the instruction manual for your fridge or, or, uh, or for your computer, a, a document that teaches you to do something practical in your life, rather than a documentary translation, which may very nicely give you a, a very formal translation of Homer, which you're not really expected to do anything with. It's just telling you what's there in the in the source text, which and that distinction has all sorts of implications for the level of uh, contextualization. A documentary translation doesn't need to be very contextualized or domesticated or or brought into your own terms of reference. It can stay, uh, you know, in ancient Greek, really, in it, that thought world. Whereas uh, an instrumental translation is going to require a significant amount of uh, localization. We're just going to pass the mic right down the aisle so you guys get ready. Um, oh. Yeah, um, Andy, uh, what, uh, what about the result of iconoclasm as uh, of a quality translation as opposed to the goal of a quality translation? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I think I'm saying that if the focus is iconoclasm in, in your quality goals of translation, that's that's misguided. It, I mean, it feels to me like it is. It feels like this is this is going to be a natural result of a good translation rather than you're you're going for iconoclasm in, in your uh, methodology. Thank you. So, no, I appreciate the, the question back on that. Uh, I, I'm intending that as a as a feature that the translation, something that the translation is intending to be, not something that it's intending to achieve in people. There's all sorts of other things it's intending. I mean, as I say, it's a tool, it's a means to an end. Uh, the, my biggest problem is when the Bible becomes an end in itself. Uh, so the, it's the, it should be an iconoclastic tool with respect to other Bible translations. Um, it's uh, like like a you know like a catalyst that that uh, performs a function but then uh, disappears itself. That it's not not part of uh, giving that kind of prominence to the Bible itself is not the point. It's supposed to be a signpost towards something much greater. Um, that that's what I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't express it too well. As you can imagine, this didn't come from somewhere else. This is rather new thinking. So uh, I I mean it as a characteristic of the product itself. Uh, and there are lots of other ways. I mean, there are places where I work where it may be appropriate to produce a product which does draw a certain attention to itself, especially in a culture where people honor sacred books. Um, so you, you, there's all sorts of ways that I, I myself would, would query that value. And yet I think across the board, it, it's really important. And, and some of the most beautiful and fantastic, uh, real genius, uh, Muslim idiom translations and publications that I've been involved in and, and seen, there's a real danger that in the next generation they might end up becoming idols, which will really be tragic. So they're, they're great, they're, they're, they're deconstructive in very helpful ways with respect to the present. We need to think about what they're going to do in the, in the future. Yeah. yeah. We okay? All right, so church councils have played significant roles in quality in lots of different ways throughout church history. Um, is there a role for those type of early church church councils in this maybe move towards church-centric focus in translation? 
I work for an organization that works with all the churches and is very eager to include, be fully inclusive of all people who understand themselves as Christians. Um, yes, absolutely. But I'm not very comfortable with uh, bodies that claim to speak for the whole church, but are not actually all inclusive. And that happens, I'm afraid, rather a lot. Uh, and we see pronouncements, you know, the churches say this, and you think, well, which churches? Have you included actually all of them? So, yes, I agree with you. Absolutely. I don't know how feasible that is these days. Um, as I say, just coming back from Nigeria, the world of a million different churches, uh, can we include everybody? I don't know. But, uh, uh, yes, there's a place for Christians to talk together. Obviously, this is not the generation for edicts and pronouncements or, or um, imposing laws on the church, but for us to reach real good agreement about as much as we can agree about. Yeah. So I'm looking at the Woody Guthrie sticker there. Yeah. And I'm thinking about Jesus and the Pharisees. And it seems to me that when you're saying you want to go kill idols, it's very important to be intentional about that, to know that you're killing the same idols that Jesus would have killed yeah. if you were standing here now. Yeah. Um, now, we're not Jewish Pharisees in in the time of Jesus. And so it's, we see a lot of people killing a lot of idols that maybe shouldn't be killed in our culture. So what is what are the things that the Bible ought to be doing? What are the things we need to avoid watering down, that, that there's a real danger of watering down because we don't want to offend our cultures? Um, and how do we know when we've really killed the same idols that Jesus would want to, the Jesus that we see in Scripture? Um, I pray that again, I doubt that I'm very qualified to answer such a broad question. Um, when I'm talking about killing idols, I'm talking about killing textual or telling, killing scriptural idols, right? We're talking about doing away with uh, sacred texts which have failed to perform their function as signs towards Jesus and instead have drawn attention to themselves. And that might be the source text or a first translation or a, a regional translation. Think of the context where many of you work. Uh, you've experienced these kind of things, I, I believe. It seems very common where I've worked. Um, destroying those those textual idols that have been set up, uh, which have in the church effectively taken the place where Jesus should be. Uh, that's what I'm talking about, not uh, a much broader thing. If you're talking about uh, the removal of Christian symbolism and language and uh, traditions from Western culture, uh, you could probably guess what I'm going to say, which is let the stuff go. We can do without it. Uh, my faith in Christ has got nothing to do with celebrating Christmas and Easter or to do with the uh, speaking of Bible texts in, in public schools, that kind of thing. I, to me, let the stuff go. Use those beautiful church buildings for cinemas. Brilliant. Because my church will meet in a warehouse. Anyway, <laughs> give them away. Let it go. We don't need that kind of stuff in Western culture. It has not served us well. And as a British person, I see my uh, birth culture and where the culture that I work, live and work in now in Switzerland, across Europe, I see how our culture has been uh, become a weight of history on the church, which inhibits our growth, not a benefit. So let that stuff go. Sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, I really appreciated what you had to say about iconoclasm in quality of translation. It's definitely something that's going to be causing me to think for a while. I was curious if you had, if you've touched upon it um, and you've talked a bit about the idea of um, making sure the Bible, the, the translation doesn't draw attention to itself. But translations like the King James Version were intentionally were originally intended to be very iconoclastic, to break down what had come before them. So so what does it look like for a Bible translation to be iconoclastic? What what sort of things, what sort of processes do you put into your Bible translation to make it iconoclastic? Thank you very much. Uh, the things that I can think of that really are very helpful are deliberately using very uh you know, making sure that your Bible translation is short-lived by using very local, very time-bound language, like the, some of the linguistic things I, I, I 
put there. We know that some of the words that people are using today are not going to be used in another 10 years. Some of the so youth slang and so on. We know it changes. Some of the youth slang that I knew is not used anymore. My children laugh at me. Uh, those kind of things. Paratext is extremely important. I think probably, despite ourselves, we probably need to increase our use of paratextual information. We need more footnotes. We need more maps and more diagrams. And uh, we need more study Bible kind of notes. Of course, we our, our notes need to be... Um, forgive the word, uh, objective, uh, we need to do study Bibles. Devotional Bibles is another thing altogether, but we, even within a study Bible, uh, those can be highly time-specific. You know, we're also, uh, you know, af afraid to put things in dollars and cents because we have to put it in terms of a, a day's wages because we know that the value of a dollar is going to change. Uh, that's very common in places where the currency changes very quickly. Um, I'm just using the dollar and cent as an example. But... Uh, those kind of things, deliberately doing things which are going to make the translation short-lived and then revising it very quickly and putting even in the preface that this is our attempt for now of a translation, next year it will be better. And getting the community to have that kind of awareness that it's going to, the translation is going to improve and going to change as their linguistic habits change and as the community's understanding of uh, exegesis and hermeneutics, as, as the church develops, uh, increasing that awareness that there's there's change ahead. This is not a once and for all. In the footnotes of my paper, you'll see a reference to the uh, a decision that was made by the ESV that some of you are aware of, uh, which went absolutely the other way and claimed that it was going to be a never to be revised edition. I don't think that should ever exist. It's absurd. That's an that's an idol. We have we have a question from online. Can you expand on the statement? colleagues and partners on the autism spectrum may have much to teach me about how best to communicate metaphors. Is this something that you have practiced or an idea that you have? Thank you. Uh, it's an idea that I've had. It's not something I practice, but I think it's extremely important. I would love it to become uh, more of a focus. And I know that there's at least one other person in the room who's thought about these things, um, which is that um, many people that I've known who, who are autistic or in, in some way, uh, find it very difficult to interpret metaphors and so our standard bible translations really are not helpful since the bible is full of metaphor absolutely full of it and if you just haven't got your mind doesn't work in that way to interpret i'm talking of very uh, as a very inexpert person please forgive me but i i just see the struggles of autistic people to cope with the, these metaphors and, and reading them as if they were meant literally um and I feel it's a, a real important thing for our community that we learn to express in, in ways that are more suitable for autistic people. Uh, and so when we see the misunderstandings, then we ought to be developing ways of communicating very well with, with that very large number of people. And by the way, many of us, and I'm certain that many of us in this room know that they're in some sense on the autism spectrum. And I, I'd love that that be perceived as a great strength and something that we can contribute to this work. Um, okay, thank you very much, Andy. Okay, let's express our appreciation for the speaker.